right, so the talk is throw some keys on it, uh, data modeling for key value data stores by example. Uh, my name is Hector Castro. Um, that's my handle pretty much everywhere. Um, disclaimer up front, I work for Basho. We make a distributed uh, key value database. Uh, quick story about, a uh, quick backstory here. Uh, I was in Mexico. In Mexico, uh, you'll run into scenarios where if you're sitting down in like an open cafe area, a guy like this will approach you and he will put his hand on you and he won't make a sound and he'll stay there until you pay him money. <laughs> if you're with someone else, he will then do the same thing to them and stand there until you give him money. Uh, so if software doesn't work out for any of us, this is a nice professional to look forward to. <laughs> Um, so how many people have seen something like this, like hanging on somebody's cube wall or somebody printing it out uh, to try to explain what the database, uh, what relationships are between a bunch of different entities in a database? So relational databases aren't all bad, right? They give us things that are very attractive from a developer's perspective. You know, they, give us, they give us relationships, uh, you know, establishing relationships between multiple entities when you're denormalizing give you transactions, you're trying to make modifications to multiple rows or multiple objects at the same time, you want them to happen in an atomic way. Um, they give you schemas, so you can define types against particular objects, so you can optimize, you can say, this is going to be a date for my range query, so you can make your range queries fast, this is an integer. Uh, the ability to extend existing schemas, so if you want to alter a table, you can do all these things in a relational database. And the last thing, probably one of the most important things, is that you can use ad hoc queries, you can use SQL, to access all of the data inside of your database. So then the question is, you know, what if your application doesn't need most of that? Or more importantly, what if things like latency, things like scale or high availability trump a lot of the features that you're getting out of a relational database? Basically, your application requires these more than it requires some of those other features we went, went through. So this is where key value data stores come into play, more specifically distributed key, key value data stores. So a couple of reasons why they're attractive. So they're schemaless. You know, we saw this in a couple of talks yesterday. Single access reads. You're doing primary key reads. So generally, things are going to be very fast if you're trying to do high rate uh, workloads. They're also pretty good for write-heavy workloads. A lot of times, key value data stores are append only, so these writes can be very fast. In general, they're easier to scale, if not simply because you, know, you have a much more restricted API, so there's a lot of things that you don't have to worry about if you're trying to scale a key value data store. You don't have to worry about joins, you don't have to worry about grouping data across multiple shards. And it's a familiar interface, so it's just, it's just a hash. So a couple of examples here. In Ruby, if you have a hash or a map, you can assign a value to it and print it out. You can assign a more complicated structure. You can serialize that, you can store it there. You can even just take image files and put them inside, right? So you can do a lot of these same things with key value data stores because they're just storing binary data. So a lot of times, even, even I did this, is when you know, you're presented with this very primitive way of interacting with data. The immediate, the immediate thing is, okay, that's cool, but my application is too complicated, so I can't use this data store. I need something more complicated. I need rows, I need tables, I need columns. So the example I'm gonna walk through is relatively simple, um, but it's something that, uh, it gave me an aha moment when I was you know, figuring out how to model applications for key value data stores, and I think it's produced a lot of other aha moments with other people that I've interacted with. So I felt compelled to put it together in a presentation to hopefully give you the same aha moment. So are people familiar with this application? For anybody who's not, Uber is just like a mobile application for you to request drivers, like basically black car limousines, uh, also now they're expanding to regular cars, to come to a location that you're at, pick you up, take you wherever you need to go. Transactions happen through credit cards, no real interaction with the driver. Um, it's basically like optimized cab service. So you think about this, you start thinking about like geolocation, you start thinking about making geospatial queries. You know, the engineer and a lot of us will automatically start thinking like, well, I know Postgres has geospatial queries. I know that Solar has geospatial queries. That's the first thing I'm gonna reach you to try to solve this problem. So I'm gonna try to walk through an example of how you'd solve this with a key value data store. So Uber has a couple of components. Uh, the first one is 
the driver itself, right, the black card. Then there's you, wherever you are, wherever you're located, wherever you're requesting this car from. And then there's the entire map, right, where you are, where you're located, the area around you. So let's start with the driver. So the driver is in this particular quadrant. So we're taking the map and we're kind of slicing it up. Now, if we assume that, that you know, the pin here is at zero, zero, then if we go over one and go down two, we can assume that this driver is at the coordinate one, negative two. So we're not, using, uh, we're not using latitude, longitude precisely here because we're just trying to generalize into these larger blocks. So to propose a, you know, a way to uh, describe this particular, uh, if I was trying to request this car, um, you have a date, a time, and the coordinates. So now this is an example of what it would look like in React because React has a notion of something called buckets. But generally, we're just using the date here and the time as a namespace. We're just saying we want to namespace it by this particular date and time. So if, if, if a key value disk you're trying to use doesn't have a notion of buckets, you just prepend something before the key, and then you add a slash or a dash or whatever. And then the payload would be an array or a list of the cars inside that particular quadrant, right? So now we're going to try to walk through some Ruby code. Um, so we have a function called emit car location, and it has a couple of arguments. We have a car ID, we have a color, which is not necessarily meaningful here, just for, for logging output, and then we have a latitude, longitude, we're faking that. We're creating the bucket, or in another example, might just be the namespace. So basically we're just creating that, that black portion. Then we're just printing out some logging information so we can get an idea of what's going on. Then we're creating uh, a data structure and we're adding the car ID to it, right? So this data structure is called a G set. So first question that probably pops up is what's a G set, right? I'm familiar with a set, but what, what is this G set? So a G set is, is, is um, a data structure that's categorized as a conflict-free replicated data type, right? Uh, most commonly these things are known as CRDTs, right? So just abbreviating, taking the, the first letter of each of those words. CRDTs are data, data types that were designed for uh, eventually consistent data stores, right? They were designed for systems that are based around eventual consistency. They're not strongly consistent. And all they do is they preserve the properties that you would expect out of the data structure, um, but they don't lock, they remain highly available, and they have self-healing properties. So the G stands for grow only. So it's a grow only set. So set union itself, so if you have just the regular set in Ruby, the, the act of merging multiple sets together is commutative and convergent. Therefore, it's always safe to have simultaneous writes um, which only allow addition. So you're only allowed to add items to the set. You're not allowed to remove them from the set. So why might removing items from a set be bad? It's bad because you don't want to have a scenario where you're removing cars from a particular quadrant or from a particular cell and they belong there. Uh, so for example, if you're requesting a car and there's one right outside, you don't want a scenario to occur where that car gets removed from the list and you're getting a car dispatched from like down, you know, five blocks away when you have one sitting right outside. So if we keep walking through the code here, we're just creating a key. We're passing a content type because we're communicating with the, with the backend data store through HTTP and we're serializing that data structure to JSON. So for this particular data type, this is what it might look like, right? So we have some information about what the type is because we need to know how to deserialize and serialize it. And then we just have a list of the items that are in this particular G set. So now if we move to the next phase here, we have the setup location or where you're getting picked up from or where you're requesting the car from. So again, if we're assuming that you know, you're in zero, zero, this is where you're at. So now the function, or what it might look like to try to request the car, right? So you already have the cars that are using the previous function to just emit their location periodically as they drive around. But now you're trying to request the car from all the cars that are existing in the system. So the request car function takes two arguments, a latitude, longitude, your latitude, longitude. 
So we have a function here called closest blocks and we're passing it to latitude and longitude. All this function is basically doing is, you're right here, but most likely there's not gonna be a car here. So it's also getting the blocks that are immediately around you. So that that way we can try to go through all of them to see if we can keep doing that until we find a car that's in your area. Then we're just printing out some logging information. Then we're taking the output of the previous function we're just taking the keys out of it, we're sorting them, and then we're trying to iterate through them. So what, what does that look like? So the, the output of the local grid, this is what it might look like. So the keys are the computed distance. So we're assuming that the coordinates are latitude, longitude, but they're not really. Um, if we apply a function, we can try to get an idea of how far they are from my location. So I'm going through and I'm tabulating that math, and then the value of this particular key is the latitude longitude coordinates. So I'm sorting them by distance so that I can make sure that the first one I try to interact with is the closest one to me, so that I don't start getting cars that are far away from me. So now we want to try to get the closest car to my location. So now if we go into this function, get cars at location. Again, we're passing a latitude, longitude. We're doing the same thing as before where we're defining this particular bucket with the timestamp. We're creating a new G set because we wanna be populating things in it. And then the next thing here is, so up here, we got an object from the data store for that particular uh, latitude, longitude pair. We're checking its siblings. So what are siblings? So this is something that's a little bit more specific to React. So, in this case right here, uh, you would probably do this somewhat sim differently in another key value data store, but this is how you would approach it in, in React. So siblings in React are a mechanism to prevent data loss when you have scenarios like concurrent writes or network partitions. So I'm gonna try to walk through an example of the last one and just explain like, what might cause this particular scenario, what, what, why these siblings are important. So in a lot of distributed data stores, you're writing data multiple times. So you have multiple replicas of a particular piece of data throughout multiple machines in a cluster. So we have a piece of data A, we have three replicas. We're gonna assume that each of these replicas are on a different machine in the cluster. So this line down the middle here is meant to illustrate a network partition. So this is a scenario where nodes in your cluster can't talk to each other because something happened inside your data center or something happened in Amazon or whatever. Now we have application servers that might be talking to this data store. We might have some on this side of the partition. We might have some on this side, right? Say one on this side writes B, one on this side writes C. So now when the network partition goes away, how do we know which one of these is supposed to win, right? A lot of times data stores will just pick the last one or whichever one is perceived to be the last one, meaning you may lose B or you may lose C. You don't necessarily know. The data store doesn't know which one is actually right. So what React does um, is it'll keep both. So you'll have B and you'll have C because it can't figure out which one it needs to win. And so in this scenario, so going back to the Uber example, every time that we're adding cars to this G set, we're effectively creating another one of these siblings. So that there's a, you know, a set of siblings inside the data store and then this line right here, you're basically going through all the siblings and you're applying that set union. So since it's only allowing addition, you're never losing cars from that particular object. You're just continually appending them, which is producing the output, which is the, the list of cars that are in you know, the area that's closest to you. And then here, we're just taking that same thing and we're, uh, we're you know, that output of that set union, and we're sending it back to the data source saying, look, this is what I want you to persist. So going back to the other example, so you have this, this uh, list of siblings what we're doing is we're merging that together and we're sending it back as a new value. So we're grabbing all the cars in that particular quadrant, that particular location, and we're sending that back and we're saying persist this so that the next person that tries to retrieve it gets this list and doesn't have to go through this process. So you're paying the cost at read time as opposed to paying the cost at write time. So once that whole process is done, uh, you're calling dot members, which um, is just uh, the API for the particular G set. So it's how you're getting the elements out of it. And if that's greater than zero, then you have a car. If not, then you're going back to the top of the loop and you're going to the next block to identify whether there's a car in that area. And you keep going until you know either you run out, you go through too many, and there's just nobody around you, uh, or you actually get a hit. 
So um, the next thing here is just to emphasize that what we went through was basically uh, creating this G set on the client side, right? So we were, we were creating this data structure, we were defining it on the client side, and we're, use, we're basically abusing the data store a little bit to give us the properties that we want around this G set. Um, in the next version of React, we're including these data structures on the server side. So what that means is that the API, instead of a lot of that boilerplate code, a lot of that code that I showed before, this is what it would look like. Um, you know, you would just add cars to them, uh, add cars to this particular key, and the data store would merge siblings together, would resolve these conflicts. At the same time, you would just use that same pointer to that key, and then you would get the members, and you would have a list. Um, the the Ruby API uh, for React specifically is, was actually developed by a guy that's sitting right here, Bryce, uh, who gave a talk yesterday. Um, so if you have questions specifically about the Ruby client. Um, He's the person to ask. Um, so to, to try to you know, wrap up the talk, when, when would doing all this stuff be attractive, right? So we, we walk through some, you know, conceptually it's not too difficult to understand how Uber might work, but then there's some tricky parts there about modeling the G set, uh, about creating something that can work in an eventually consistent environment, right? And so that's a lot more complicated than just adding rows to a database and using whatever functionality it has to do geospatial queries, right? And so the answer to that is basically what I mentioned before, is when these three things start impacting. So it's not when you're trying to create an Uber service for your local neighborhood, it's when you're trying to create an Uber service for like the entire United States and you're trying to serve it out of the same you know, data center. Or it's if you're trying to ingest metrics out of a lot of consumer devices that are all across the world. Like if somebody has you know, one of those uh, activity monitors and you're trying to ingest the metrics that are getting emitted by those things, you need a system that is highly available, produces low latency, and, or operates at low latency, and can handle scale. And with that, uh, that's all I got. <laughs>